All right, let's begin. Thank you guys so much for joining. Today we'll be going over the best extracurriculars for elementary learning in the Bay Area. But don't worry, a lot of the presentation, a significant majority will be applicable to uh, those outside the Bay Area as well. Uh, it will be helpful. So don't worry. Before I get started, well, most of you guys will be thinking, well, extracurriculars, of course, that's important. In your minds, you're probably like, yes, it's important for colleges. And that's true. So I'm going to look at this from two perspectives. Yes, from the perspective of higher education, it is very important. So the proficiencies in extracurriculars have uh, increased year on year in terms of the talent pool, especially in the top colleges. The academic pool is very, very uh, it's, 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 it's quite proficient, but when you look at the extracurriculars, that becomes the key differentiator and has become more important uh, over the years. If we look at Stanford and all the elite colleges, uh, the extracurriculars is, is used to be an equal chunk and now has become an even more uh, larger part of the admissions process. So it's very important for higher education success. That's the first perspective. And not just any type of extracurriculars. Parents often say, okay, we're in elementary school, we're going to look at some ECs and we're going to try and do a bunch of things, piano, uh, fencing, a bunch of different things. And that's good. Yes, it's, it's good to venture out and see what you're interested in for sure. Uh, that's how you develop a passion. But purely in terms of higher education, when you get there, quantity is good, but you would rather be excelling in one or multiple domains if possible, rather than be a jack of all trades. So specifically in the admissions process, you are looking at sort of like a plot. You're pitching a plot to a studio, if I have to make an analogy, right? The story is going to be weak if you're just having 50 different things going on. It's going to be coherent if there's one thing threading the needle between all of them. So say if you are interested in chess and robotics, and uh, let's say you also like the spelling bee, then the way you would thread that is in your essay where you would coherently describe, okay, I am intrigued by puzzles and I always like solving things. And that is how X, Y, Z is correlated. So it's important that you excel in one particular domain via your extra extracurriculars, as opposed to just taking a bunch and showing, okay, I've done 20 other things and that's why I'm excelling here. Everyone else is gonna be doing the same. So you need to have a plot, right? Think of it as pitching a plot. But from another perspective, and this is something that I think is more valuable, extracurriculars are crucial because you wanna find a passion and get out of your comfort zone. Those two things, are critical at an early stage in elementary school, right? It's the best medium to acquire skills that seem beyond your comfort zone. So if you're scared of something, it's a good idea to venture into it at an early stage just to get over that fear. And number two is has it has benefits outside, uh, just beyond the classroom as well. It's where you develop a true passion, a true calling, which is more important than anything else. And finally, if you look at the US census data, it's pretty clear that if children are heavily involved in some sort of EC, say it's sports, anything, then their attention within class and performance increases as well. Um, this is, this is uh, pretty established and the numbers are quite staggering. In fact, I was surprised myself. So it's important. You guys already know all of that. So let's get into a deep dive for what we think are some of the key extracurriculars that we would like to highlight. A note before I start, when I say best extracurriculars, this is just the three that we have picked uh, that make the most sense when you look at it from the perspective of cognitive development, from logic. How do we develop logic at an early stage? There's so many different extracurriculars and we wouldn't have the time to go over all of them. If you want a short answer, the best extracurricular is the one your child is interested in. But we're gonna highlight three of them beginning from speech and debate. We'll start with significance, the Bay Area landscape and resources. Before I start with this point, what do you guys think is the greatest fear of elementary students? You guys can uh, enter the poll, although the answer is pretty obvious because we are on the topic of speech and debate, so it's not much of a poll, but it is of course public speaking, right? And this is not just in terms of kids, some adults also face that uh, pressure later in their life it is the most common fear along with heights. 
So close to 25% of students that are polled say that they're fearful of speaking in front of their friends, being made fun of. So if this is the biggest fear, this makes complete sense that this is something that kids should venture into so they get over that, right? It is the best EC for all around development. We start from step one by getting over that fear. Then it builds your communication skills. And once you are good in the, that department, say you have developed this sufficiently, then you can have that sense of confidence and take up a leadership position. Debates, speech clubs often work in teams. So if you get good at this aspect, it is, it's quite common to see some leadership skills in an early stage. And finally, we get into the logic part because it's not just enough to hash out uh, clear communication that sounds nice and crispy and makes it sound like you know what you're talking about. At the end of the day, you're gonna be facing people who are out to dissect your arguments. So speech and club for number one reason why it's important besides the ones I've stated is it is important for cognitive development, right? It is teaching you how to structure your thoughts and come up with a nice thesis, which is important throughout our daily lives, right? It's about problem solving. So let's look at some of the schools that were ranked for speech and debate. This is the NSDA, which is the National Speech and Debate Association. It is the main authority in the US to rank schools based in this criteria. So a little bit of uh, context, a perfect score is 900 points and a low score is 100 points. So the NSDA every year ranks the schools in the US, all over the US based on this uh, particular uh, uh, ranking system. And when you look at those rankings, you'll see that California specifically has the largest representation in the top 100, right? If you look at the NSDA, California represents 12% of all the top schools in uh, the US, not just the top schools, all the schools that have been ranked. In the top 25, we have six schools. In the mid 50s, we have five. And in the lower uh, tier, we have one school all over the US. This is just in the top 100 schools. So even if it's lower, that is still amazing because if you're 99 out of the whole nation, that is splendid, right? So the point being is that most schools are above the US average. However, if you look deep into this data and you dissect it, uh, you will see some uh, troubling uh, factors, right? Some things that are a cause of concern. And that is the representation is skewed towards uh, the top 20 schools indeed, but also when you look deep into the data for all of the schools, not just the top 100, some things are a little bit concerning. So there are no schools at the 900 point level. When I said top 25 over here, these schools in the top 25 were from the 700 and 800 level. So California has no schools in, in the 900, which is dominated by East Coast schools, specifically the ones in New York. And the second problem is that the representation of all of the schools, not just top 100, all over the US, the ones in California lie and represent the bottom tier, relatively the lower to the mid tier. If you can look at the number of schools that were polled, so there are three schools that are in the 600, 900 points, again, zero being in the 900, uh, three schools, apologies. There are six schools in the mid tier, 400, 500, and there are 58 schools in the lower tier. So although it says it's just 12% and 10%, that is the representation because more schools are there at the bottom tier and the lower tier compared to the higher tiers. But the staggering large, like this 58 number is significantly higher than, than most of the others, which is why there are some rooms of improvement in this domain, specifically speech and debate in these schools. Now that we're out of California, uh, just one last point for California specifically, there are many external clubs that can cultivate that proficiency. Uh, just a little side note, we're not a, like linked with any of these institutions. This is just based on research, so we can recommend what is a good external source for you guys to use if you are located in the Bay Area. The best one is the Golden State Academy. Uh, we do know some parents from there and the kids have won medals and awards. Uh, the reviews are good as well and Little Loudspeakers Academy. The rest are Bay Area Debate, Envision After School and Achiever Institute. Now, 
I'm not going to sit here and say this is the best or that is the best. The only one I know from personal experience is Golden State Academy. Do your own research. If you do think external resources is the one you want to go, because although the reviews, I can give you an average, it's based on your location. So you have to look at the ones that are next to you and see which one works best if you want an external source. But if you want to improve on your own, there are many ways you can do that as well. Right, you don't have to rely on some external source, even though most of the schools in California will be in the lower to mid tier uh, for debate. There are many ways you can improve your efficiency. First one being offensive debating tactics, defensive debating tactics, and classical debating skills and techniques. So I'm going to go through this uh, slightly quickly because uh, this is more advice for kids, but you can, of course, note down all this information. And if you're interested, we do have a series of upcoming webinars and uh, we can venture into this topic specifically. So offensive debating tactics. When you're in debate and speech clubs, you have a for and against topic. When you're on the offensive, you're attacking your opponent's argument, right? The most important thing for this is prepare, prepare, prepare. The luxury you have being on the offensive side is that you have time to come up with a nuanced argument. So that is on your side. So your research phase needs to be very important. And you need to stay on topic. Often what happens on the defensive side of things is that, well, they don't have that much time uh, to really anticipate what is going to be the flow of your arguments. Yes, they can put in, uh, they can brainstorm and see these at the different avenues they can go in, but they don't know for sure. So time is not on your side if you're on the defense. So sometimes students on the defensive side try to maneuver out of arguments. So if you're on the offensive side, you need to stay on topic. Uh, in general, kids need to learn how to speak slowly, coherently, and charismatically. Now, the last part comes with practice, but slowly is something I can't emphasize for parents. They think co communication skills is when you can read fast. That is not important, at least in the start. It's to explain your points slowly and coherently. As long as you have gotten your point across, the pace does not matter, right? That is more of a that is more of your preference per se, right? Of course, you don't have to be too slow or too fast. Those are the extremes, but the pace does not matter, I repeat. Speech and body confidence. The more we gain confidence in this level, that goes up naturally. And you need to read the audience and judge. This is something the kids need to get in their habit of. Often in debate clubs, this is something that not, uh, I would say a lot of them are not teaching, uh, especially the lower to mid tier clubs, is that well, debate is also a form of entertainment. The audience is there to hear your arguments, but it needs to be done in a way in which it does not sound monotonous. So you need to have the ability to look at a crowd and see, okay, are we honing on the same points? Okay, we should move on. Oh, this intrigued the audience, I should continue. So it needs to be more of a jazz per se, where you have to change based on the mood of the judges and the audience. Not completely, of course, you need a structure, but it is flexible. If you're on the defensive side, the most important part is actually not talking, but listening. You have to listen and take notes because you don't know for sure what your opponent is going to come with, right? If you're the strongest partner, this is where your leadership skills come in. If you're a natural leader and you're at the level of debate where you think the student is already good, you need to instill in them a habit of working in a team. Because if you're a leader and if you are the best debater per se, and you know you are, your strength is not going to be showcased by, oh, let me say the best point. If you are truly the best debater, you need to allocate points to the rest of your team, which is where leadership and teamwork comes in and make sure they all have points because it's a team effort at the end of the day, right? And lastly, classical debating skills and techniques. This is what's helpful for parents so you can help your uh, children help, uh, excel in debate is get into the habit of using illustrations and examples. As I said earlier, there's an audience, there are judges. The only way you're gonna make your argument compelling is by using some anecdotes and illustrations that can keep the conversation going in a non-monotonous way. You need to have a strong structure and conclusion. A good habit is actually just by writing essays, right? Your thesis needs to be structured. You have your main points. Each main point has a sub point. Right, your conclusion ties it up everything together. You're, you guys already know this. There's no need to go into all of this, but it's a good way to structure your thoughts. 
Do not get carried away and take cheap shots. You know your kids best. If you think they do have a tendency to maybe make some snarky comments or this is not, I wouldn't say it's bad per se. This happens in kids who are quick-witted. If they can think really quickly, they do tend to make some comments. Um, that won't work in a debate because the judges will actually, at the end of the day, it's, it's also how about your charisma, right? If you see an opening to expose someone, then don't do it. Just continue with your points and move on. Learn how to work as a team. Teamwork is very important. So if you're practicing for debate, you need to do it as a team. A good manual for this is the Debater's Guide 4th Edition. Uh, again, we're not associated with anything we're recommending today. So this is just based on what we think is the best. This is a great manual. I personally was on many debate clubs as well. So, <coughs> excuse me. I, I do know that this is very helpful. And the last point that I cannot emphasize enough is use the right influences. If your kids are into debate, and it is natural that they're gonna look at some other debaters of our world who are not so skilled, right? Political debates is very different from a scholarly debate. Political debates you win by doing two things, is making your opposition look bad and making sure you're just not as bad as them, which is why the United States is in this position. Anyways, you need to pick the right influences, right? It's the right role models. So you can learn your debating tactics after them. It's very helpful to find someone who you can model and learn how to debate after and pick the right influences. You as parents are gonna be pivotal in doing that. Before I get into the next topic, why debate is very important is at the end of the day, and this is what is gonna be the main theme of our presentation, is that it is excellent for early stage cognitive development. This is where you can really, really learn to think, right? How do I think? How do I get my point across so that it's clear and coherent? And because you have an opposition, there will be flaws in your argument. So you will have to come up with solutions on the fly. This is problem solving. So it naturally leans into the next EC we'll be talking about, which does this as well, but does have a creative angle to it, which is robotics. Before we get into robotics, uh, just curious, what are you guys interested in? Uh, speech and debate, math, I've, I've listed out a bunch, but there can be others as well. You can fill in the poll just so I get a sense of uh, what you guys are interested in. Take a few seconds, you can fill in your answers. Okay, a lot for robotics. That's, uh, that's helpful because this is the section for that. So robotics is a great channel for creativity and logic, right? Beyond just logic development, it is very creative. It leads to construction and design. When you like building things, this is the way to go. And it gives you a sense of teamwork and structure as well, because when you do this at the higher level, you are always working in a team. It gives you an early stage abstract thinking. What do I mean by that? It means at a very early level, you'll be able to understand different phases and how do they work with each other, right? Sort of like managing a project. It is very important for that angle. Not necessarily, you're not really teaching your kids how to do project management, but the fundamentals are the same. How does one phase connect to the other? and that connect to the next. How do I make all these things work together? And finally is the cognitive development. If kids are good at robotics early, it definitely lends itself towards logical development. The best way to get into this extracurricular activity is to rely on no external resource. This is one of those where you can pretty much do it yourself. So that is our recommendation and we will tell you how to exactly. There is a lot of Lego, and this might seem obvious to you guys, but it's important to pick the right ones. Lego, uh, and, and specifically, I'll, I'll give you examples for the ones that are the best for uh, mechanical side of things, and competitions. So you need to get these resources yourself and supplement them with competitions so it's more than just a fun activity. Of course, if you just prefer it being fun, that's no harm as well. But if you wanna take it to another level where you can work in a team environment, uh, and compete, which itself has its own skills, then it is very important to supplement this with competitions. So 
for Lego, the first one is practical building. Now by that, it's just simple blocks where you're just building um, just aesthetical objects for lower elementary kids specifically. I'm sure you guys must have bought your kids some sort of Lego. And it's important to see if they're interested in it. Because if you're not interested in the practical building and design part, it's less likely that you will like to go on further. Then comes the mechanical stage where you're doing construction uh, to understand structure and phases, as I said earlier. Uh, let's look at this one here. This is the mechanical part. And usually it involves a bunch of different parts that are connected together and together they make one huge object. Uh, this doesn't necessarily have to be a racetrack. Uh, it can be something like a, I've, I've seen nowadays Legos are just wonderful. You have mining uh, sites, something that is more expansive and has different parts. Do not go for Lego pieces that are focused on one part. Yes, it's good. Everything has its benefits, but purely from a mechanical perspective, you want to take different moving pieces that fit in together as one big phase. So that's good for uh, lower elementary as well. And um, so grade one to two, you can get into these things. And mid-elementary students, if they're interested uh, by now, if they're into mechanical building, they will definitely be looking at robotics. So mid-elementary students try to understand moving parts and basic engineering. And this is different from phases because different parts are now moving. And how are you supposed to layer one on top of each other so that everything is working correctly? So that's where basic circuits and robots come in. And we'll get into a little bit of that as well. Uh, before I move on to the competitions, here are some suggestions that I can give you. For mechanical, you have a lot of options. But like I said, try to go for Lego sets that are more expansive and is more of different parts that you're building together. Something like just a car is not a good idea because it's just focused on building one thing. It's not bad per se, but if you're just looking at it from a mechanical perspective, you want to make sure there's different phases so that you're planning your build. And for robotics, uh, there is a specific company called Technic. Uh, you can write that down. Technic is the best one. I personally and myself was uh, heavily into Lego, still am. I actually have a whole room filled with Lego. I love telling that to everyone I see. Uh, so Technic is the best one. And it has uh, variations where you can have uh, the circuits in there. Now, when you start off, it's okay to use the manual. Parents always ask me like, oh, is it is it fine if you use the manual? But if you're doing this, try to do this as a team activity with your kid and try to question them on why is it that we are having a motor here? What is the function, right? Question them as you go and build. That's the best way for them to start thinking about moving parts. Again, Technic is the best one out there. And then you have to supplement them with competitions. So the first Lego league is by far uh, the most, I would say diverse competition because it makes room for elementary school. Usually robotics is, is found either at a local competition that is pretty domestic. It's, it's not uh, at a national stage or statewide, or it's for higher level uh, students. The first Lego league is, 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 is pretty well known and it's good for elementary students. So there's different competitions for that. The junior first Lego league tournament is for kindergarten to third grade. This is where you have to build a finished Lego brick and display it, pretty basic. Uh, again, you work in teams, so that's what's wonderful about it. The first Lego League is from fourth grade. Uh, you can all second grade to fourth grade. Switch that up over there. And you have to build robots with certain functions. So this is where the mechanical part comes in. And it's based on the Mindstorm series. You can Google this and YouTube this. It's pretty helpful because it's more uh, like educational Lego where you'll be learning the different aspects of the moving pieces. So I do recommend looking at that series as well. Now, when you get to the higher grade, this is the same competition, first Lego league. Again, not associated with any of these. It's just the best ones out there. FLL, uh, there's junior first to senior third. Uh, this is where you will be choosing materials that are not limited to Lego, but more just pieces to build a more complex robot. And FRC is the junior three to senior three, slightly more advanced. This is where you will be making robots from scratch based on the topic and conduct three v three adversarial competitions. This is the higher 
uh, stage of robotics and the competitions that do supplement that. Besides that, however, if you do continue and say you do have some sort of success at the elementary stage, let's say even not success, let's say you don't get a medal, but you're passionate about it, then you should go on to pursue other competitions like the International Olympic Robotics Competition. In this, the regular season is divided into elementary school, junior high, and high school group competitions. There's different phases to this, and the engineering competition is limited to high school and university students only. So you have different competitions, each for a different level. Why am I honing in on this one? The International Olympic Robotics Competition and VEX. These two are very important. First, uh, before I get into the significance, the VEX Robotics World Championship is sponsored by the Robotics Education and Competition Foundation of the United States. It's also broadcasted all over ESPN. VEX robots do have a high requirement. So beyond just mechanical abilities, you do have to know basic programming. Um, and nowadays there's plenty of workshops that you can get into. I would always recommend do not force it onto the child. If they are showing that they are resistant towards it, do it as an activity, not a competition, right? Do it as a fun activity. Let's learn something new. If you like it, then great. If you don't, we're going to think of different ways. So at least you know about it. And VEX and the International Olympic Robotics Competitions is very important. Think of it as the national spelling bee, but for robotics, because this is where you do gain some recognition that goes beyond just supplemental supplementing your learning uh it goes beyond that because it gives you an edge in higher education as well college applications do look out for these two competitions specifically it does help you shine in terms of uh, your extracurriculars it gives you the edge because it is nationalized and it is on a big stage the best external look, uh, resources that you can use if if you don't want to go with the do, do it yourself approach and competitions say you were too busy to get into all of this and looking for the right uh, units, although I do recommend putting some time in it, is I have listed, this is specific to the Bay Area, is um, as you can see, I've listed each of the best uh, centers for robotics uh, based on the location. So SF and Martin, Marin, uh, Tech Know How is a very good one. In fact, Tech Know How is the best one. Silicon Valley, Silver Creek Academy is the best one. East Bay, the growing room is great. Now take all of this with a grain of salt because it's heavily based on the location. And these rankings were purely based on reviews and some knowledge that I did know from the parents. So you have to research yourself. It is heavily location specific. Some institutions do claim they go into robotics like Mathnasium and which, and I'm not criticizing them. They are great for STEM learning, but their involvement for robotics is limited to, limited to like conceptual learning not really understanding and building. So the DIY method is preferred. If you do have some time, it is well worth to look into. And like robotics, like speech and debate, the main theme of our extracurriculars throughout has been cognitive development. What are the activities that we can get into so that you can learn how to think and that to think smart, critically, right? And the best way to do that is actually math competitions. I know you, some of you guys have been in my webinars before and probably heard of this, but the reason I've highlighted this over here as well is because it's the most accessible. What do I mean by that? Well, accessibility in terms of price and in terms of location. Some of you guys are not in California. Some of you guys are outside the US. Uh, with speech and debate, your limiting factor is that the infrastructure is heavily uh, lacking in some areas, even in California, where you have most of the top 100 schools. The, as you saw, the representation was skewed towards the bottom for all of the schools. So that means that you're more than likely uh, to have a weak infrastructure to develop speech and debate skills, unless you supplement using the resources we give you. Number two, for Lego, it is an expensive habit, I will tell you, from personal experience, it is very expensive to get these pieces together, especially for a sustained period of time. If you can afford it, excellent. If you think it's not worth the price and you think that you're just looking at this from an angle of developing good logical skills and cognitive development, 
then logic-based math competitions are the best one because they're cheap. You don't need much resources. Everything is available freely online. And also they're online, right? So it's accessible. So let me get into the significance of this briefly because some of you guys have been in my previous webinars and have known this already, is for logic-based math competitions. And I'll give you the breakdown for the best ones to go for. So this is something new. It's good to bridge the common core gap. Throughout the US, uh, you have a gap in terms of the public schools where, and I'm comparing this to Asia, of course. So relative to the Indian schools and schools in China, um, this is uh, the, the common core has a little bit of a problem because it's two years behind at the elementary stage and it tries to catch up in the higher, uh, like the middle school, but the upper middle school stage. And the thing is when you jump in that stage, you're jumping really difficult topics. So because you have to rush algebra, you end up focusing less time on calculus and all these topics. So your understanding of those important topics, you don't have a lot of time dedicated in school for it. So it should be more evenly spaced out. We're not saying that it's consistently two years behind, but it is two years behind at the early stages where a little bit more uh, knowledge should be imparted. So math competitions, logic-based one specifically that I will give you examples of, helps you bridge the common core gap. Uh, it gives you a community. Students who are interested in these competitions tend to find somebody who is like-minded and thinks of problems and brainstorms in a similar way. So that's always great to have a, a study partner and it instills passions through puzzles. Say if you're not interested in math, this is a great way to get your child into it because it's not your typical learn this theory, apply this theory. It's more of a puzzle where they will get intrigued even if they're not excited, it will definitely keep their attention more than typical question. And of course, is our cognitive development. No better way than through these competitions. So this is something new, even in my uh, competition tracks. I don't think I have showed you this before. A lot of the parents were asking me through Facebook, WhatsApp that, okay, yes, it's important, but which, which ones do I do at which grade? So the typical competition track, and now I'm gonna look at this from a higher school perspective, higher education perspective. Uh, so this is how you use these competitions to shine on applications if you wanna to look to the future. If you wanna to look towards just doing this as a fun activity, I'll be explaining it in a different way on the next slide. But purely for higher education, the way you would go about it is that in elementary school, Math Kangaroo is hands down the best one because it is sometimes the questions won't even have numbers. It's, it's more problem solving than anything. If you're good at math kangaroo, you can go on to AMC 8. AMC 8 uh, is the American math contest. It is a huge competition, which can give you some sort of uh, edge in terms of higher school success. Once you do AMC 8, you can have the AMC 10 and AMC 12. The grade level is attached over there. If you do well on AMC 10 and 12, you have the AIME. Then you go on to have these different competitions. Uh, you can take a picture if you're interested in this. If you have more questions on this, I can cover it later as well. Uh, these are the different ones. They all lead up to IMO. A uh, point to note is that some of these competitions are invite only. So it's only if you excel in the previous ones. The IMO is the golden stage. This is the International Math Olympiad. Some parents are confused because you do have Olympiads at elementary school. That is different. Uh, that is uh, like Olympiad light. It's just like Olympiad's way of, uh, how do I say this in a ni nice way, trying to extend their products to lower grade parents, I guess, just for having the tag of Olympiad. Uh, IMO is where it matters. The early stage Olympiad papers actually are pretty easy. Uh, I have done them myself at school level. It's not that it's bad, but there's a lot of better options like Math Kangaroo, like Math Counts. Um, these are much better options. So IMO is where you get the recognition. Uh, if you do end up making it towards IMO, then there is nothing better purely in terms of college applications. Uh, it is a huge differentiator it, uh, and it has been for a while. Let's look at it from a different perspective, right? Uh, you already know the intellect development that can happen through these logic-based competitions. It is highly correlated with career development as well and has a lot of challenges can develop a sense of character. But like I said, 
for career development, these are highly correlated with having uh, success in higher education. And most importantly, this is the key part. Now, this is specific to Asian students. So I, I did look at the attendees and I, I made the decision to display this. Uh, I apologize if uh, you're not in this group. Uh, I will go through this quickly, but a majority of you are. So I thought it was worth looking at. So if you look at the Asian uh, academic talent pool, specifically uh, American Indian and Chinese American, then you will see that the academic talent pool has significantly increased um, over the past decade. This is, is uh, the reasons for which I won't get into now, but what's concerning is that the academic talent pool for Asian groups is significantly larger than it was. However, the admissions have stayed the same for most of the elite schools. Now, this is with the exception of Stanford and Berkeley because they are more open and they don't practice, uh, I would say, race-based admissions because uh, some of you guys probably already know Harvard is facing a lawsuit for this and uh, they do have all, um, all of the evidence in their place. But if you look at the bottom schools, let's look at, uh, just ignore the top two black lines. You'll see that over the past 10 years, the admissions from this group has stayed constant, even though the academic talent pool to choose from has significantly increased. Now, the way you can differentiate yourself, at least for the time being, if nothing changes, is to differentiate yourself through ECs and even academically. Because everyone applying to these schools, everyone in the top 20 is gonna be great at academia. So it needs to be with a different spin. That's where your competitions come in because, well, admission committees know that these competitions are more than just pure math, they're about logic. So here is a display, you can take a picture if you're interested in this as an EC. This, these are the best competitions at each grade level that I would highly recommend doing. Um, even if you're not, say, interested in competing, it's good to do it as an activity, as a way to challenge yourself, put you out of your comfort zone. I would recommend for grade one and two, three and four, Math Kangaroo. For grade four, besides Math Kangaroo, you also have Math League, the dates for which are given as well. Now, even though AMC8 is meant for eighth graders, if, this is conditional, if the students are at upper echelon and acing the test, you should start preparing for AMC8 earlier. And you can give a, a bunch of tests before you actually get into the eighth grade. So it's a good way to start. From five to six, six to eight, you can concentrate on AMC8. And math counts, math counts is also very good. When you get to the six to eight level, if you are doing well, you should look into AMC 10, where you can start giving AMC 10 papers. And finally is the AMC 12 for eight to 10. Why, again, not associated with any of these, uh, AMC is just the most accredited institution in terms of uh, just the nationwide. Internationally, it is the IMO. Nationwide, it's AMC, and it does carry a lot of weight when it comes to higher education. But as I have done many at many occasions, I would highlight MK as the standout option. Math Kangaroo is fun but challenging. If you are not interested in math, this is the best way to get interested. It is the only lower elementary test focused on logic heavy questions. It serves a great foundation for higher level testing, higher level testing. And by that, I mean, say you are good at MK, it serves as a good base to go on to other competitions because the questions, they might not be completely similar, but they test the same areas um, and the same skills, I would say. Questions are often based on real life applications and they are puzzles. You have to work your way out of different situations, which makes them very, very interesting to solve. At Think Academy, specifically, we do cover MK. So this is a breakdown. Some of you guys are already parents uh, off at the Academy in terms of the long-term courses. So you already know this. Uh, there's many ways you can go about Math Kangaroo. You don't have to go with any institution per se. There's plenty of free resources online. Um, if you're in the Think Academy WhatsApp group, I do give out the uh, Math Kangaroo test papers that usually retail for like 50 bucks. So there's a lot of free resources and we are here to help. But at the Academy, we do have a, a good foundation for competition related material. Common Core is where you would learn the basics. Common Core is what is taught at schools. It is a basic theory in the US. Uh, competition level math, as you can see in the bottom left corner, 
usually tests some areas that have uh, reliance on heavy logic application. But you cannot get to that part if you haven't bridged the gap. So I think we try to do that. Uh, and uh, we've been pretty successful um, with a, a large majority of medalists and gold medalists coming from Think. So we try to bridge, bridge that as well. But if you're not with the Academy, that's completely fine. As long as you know the resources are available online uh, if you're interested. So that concludes it for the competitions. And again, I would like to hone in on this point again. It is the most accessible. Speech and debate and uh, Lego are brilliant. And obviously a lot of this is subjective. It's based on what you're passionate about. So you should go for that first and then look at what is based on statistics and what is based on higher education. First should be your passion always. Um, but it is the most accessible by far. It is cheap. Uh, it is available online. There's plenty of free resources. So if you don't want to think too much, then this is a good way to build early stage, uh, you know, logical thinking and problem solving skills. And that is it for today in terms of our highlight on some of the best extracurricular activities for elementary learning. Uh, if you have more questions, you can join our Think Academy lobby. We'll have a Q&A session right now. Uh, so you can stay on for that if you would like. Um, we do have a lot of education consultant, consultants with us. Mr. Cade and, uh, and Judy uh, are there for this session to help you guys out. So if you have more questions, you can scan the WhatsApp code if you want to join the lobby. If you need various specific advice, our consultants are there uh, on, and, and they are there uh, to help you guys. There's a free one-on-one -on -one session. Uh, some of the parents over here have already taken it and have found it pretty helpful. You can ask them if they have. Um, and we try to get as much data as possible first. So you need to tell us your specific situation and then we can get into a deep dive into your specific school, what it lacks, what it doesn't, uh, the best ways to supplement learning for that specific school. So uh, you can scan that if you wanna book a consulting session. And we also have our upcoming webinar on the best private schools in the peninsula area. So this is local of course, but if you are part of this area, are planning to move there soon or have friends in this area, I would recommend joining that as well. With that, we will start our Q&A session. With my first question, uh, yes, Michael. Um, so Michael's question is for ECs, what about research? Is research an EC that we should be looking at? Um, this is a very, very interesting point. Uh, and something, if you guys are, are staying, I would, uh, and, and not staying for the Q&A, I would recommend staying for this part. ECs, although yes, you have sports, you have fencing. Again, I reiterate, you should go with what you're passionate about. But if you wanna give students a basic understanding of research, this is a new thing where around grade four, grade five, kids are having research methodology workshops where you are explained the basics of research, right? Your, how does research work? How does academia work? You have your abstract uh, literature review, how to get journal publications. Now, obviously these workshops don't really uh, have kids write a paper or anything, but they take a basic topic, something even as basic as making bubbles, right? And they try to conduct experiments wherein the kids will write their hypothesis, they will write a paper, they will understand uh, how does this process work with kids being, no, I wouldn't say kids, but with, the, with high school kids churning out research papers nowadays, um, believe it or not, uh, the publications are starting pretty early. We have seen a trend in that middle school has also started to do some activities where research has become something that kids are interested in. Again, not heavy research, no publications, but how does the process work and how can we apply it to a basic experiment like um, making bubbles or something like that. So it is very important. And the problem with this is that uh, it is very location specific. So some areas will have these workshops, but the good thing is that a lot of these are available online. If you're interested in this, uh, do type it in the chat or send me a text. Um, and I will have a follow-up webinar if there's enough interest in this. We can have a deep dive into research methodology uh, at an early stage to invigorate interest 
uh, in academia. Okay, let me go to the other questions. What is the right age to start debate? Uh, this is subjective to a certain extent. You should not start it too late. And by that, I mean middle school, um, upper middle school would be a little late. Um, there is no late again, I say this is subjective because the thing is that if it is a skill that you've always had and other skills that come with getting good at debate is something that you already possess, then getting to debate late and say, hey, I've always been good at this. Let me try it in terms of competition. You can do it later. But if it's skills that you are lacking, that you think your child is lacking, like speaking or, or explaining arguments in a coherent fashion, you should get in as soon as you can, provided it's done with the angle of developing an interest. If it's done as a chore, what happens is that students think of it as a chore and try to get out of it. So you need to assess it. This is based on your uh, specific situation. Again, with this sort of question, I would recommend the consulting session so I can uh, give you a more specific answer because I don't know the context of this. But it depends on the skills you possess, the interests of the child, and also what are your expectations. As kids enter middle school, middle school, there is almost no time for ECs. How can we narrow down to one or two ECs for kids and also help them with time management? This is a good question. Um, very good question. It depends on the school they're going to and the workload they have. So again, this is very specific. Um, if it is a school that you know tends to get more hectic in middle school, so you always say, let me give a random school like Stratford right? A challenger. Let's take challenger. Say you're at the school, you know the workload is very heavy. If you're there from the start, then you need to prioritize ECs as soon as you can so that the kids have a couple of years to see what avenues they're interested in. Now, the kids are kids. They might be interested in something today, something tomorrow. So I see what you're going with is that time management can be an issue. So you need to have a plan. In the first three years, say you start from grade one, I am sure the kids would have tried out plenty of activities to know for sure they like one thing. So if that is the case, then that is your main goal. Let's say now they come to middle school and now they're in a situation where they're interested in something else. Do not stop it. But of course, you need to continue with your other interests. Do not just abandon it. Um, but of course, this is very specific to the child. So generalizing here would be a little bit wrong. With time management, it's based on the school. Uh, some grades are more important than others, believe it or not, based on the school, because uh, uh, each school is a different learning track where some topics are prioritized later. So say you're in middle school, but the workload is high, you can afford to let go of uh, some of the academic rigor and compensate it for ECs based on the school. So again, this would be specific to the school. Do you have any recommendations for research methodologies? Yes, uh, just covered that. Um, I will send a recording in there as well. Uh, if you, and, and again, if more parents are interested in this, I would gladly host another webinar on this. Could you please talk about debating contests a little bit? Sure, let me go back to the different debates. For debating competitions, um, and could you just elaborate a little bit? Are you are you looking for competitions? If that is the case, then for competitions, the good thing with debate is that uh, it is one of the most popular extracurriculars. Uh, oh, had a little word jumble there. Most popular extracurriculars. So the good thing with that is that every school has a debate club. Most schools, 90% will have a debate club and will give you the opportunity to go to the higher stage. As you saw in a research, Today, the problem does not lie in the accessibility for competitions because the school will provide that. The problem lies in the quality of uh, teaching for this skill that is uh, lackluster in the average school. Is Math Kangaroo online or in person? For this year, you have the option for both. Uh, I do anticipate, obviously, that in the future, they are going to try and make it 
uh, offline, but this is a guess. Uh, they have both options for the coming year. Will you be sharing the recording for this later? Yes, absolutely. Is there a way to see any past recordings? Um, yes, Ramit, you can, uh, you can text me uh, the topics that you're looking for, and I can try and dig up anything that we have done that's related to that and maybe help you out that way. If you're not part of the group, I recommend being part of the lobby because I always uh, send the webinar recording in the lobby in case you've missed out. So let me go back to the end slide so you can scan it if you're not part of it. Uh, thank you so much for the kind words, uh, Vidya. I really appreciate um, that. Thank you so much. That's very sweet of you. And I appreciate you coming to all these sessions. Um, really a true testament of your dedication. Any other questions? If not, uh, we can bring this to an end. Again, here are the three uh, Neha, you have a question. I see your hand is raised. You can unmute yourself or you can type it in the chat, uh, whatever you prefer. Neha? Not able to unmute? One sec. Just a second. Uh, are you able to unmute now? Is that uh, can you can you can you try now? No. Okay. Just a second. I'll get to you just in a uh, a minute now. Uh, Kate is helping us out over here. And um, is Math Kangaroo just online? No, it is offline as well. Um, sorry, uh, apologies for online. Uh, it will, there's two different sign up process. First of all, um, the online version is you can go to uh, apologies. I see I was unmuted. So online you can uh, register as well, and it is offline, both. Yeah, Although I, some centers are limited, some centers won't have it. I would recommend just going for the online version this year. Uh, if you were attending my MK webinar previously, I actually did mention that this is somewhat of an advantage. Uh, uh, the fact that it's online has a lot of advantages, so I would recommend doing it online. What is the best way to start competitive exams for grade one and grade two? Get into Math Kangaroo. I always say this. Uh, I have to. Uh, that's the best exam. Don't treat it like an exam because you don't want to associate the word exam with this competition. You can start looking at it differently. You can just give some worksheets. If you have a, I'm sure that you have some sort of study schedule with your kid. Uh, instead of uh, say, say you have a schedule, instead of homework problems from school, you can give them a math kangaroo paper, say, hey, you know what, we can freshen it up a little bit. Predictably, uh, the kids will enjoy it a little bit more because it's a lot better. Um, uh, it's a lot better in terms of uh, engaging the kids' interest. The questions are a lot more uh, based on puzzles and logic. So I would do G1 to do math kangaroo. Please suggest some practice materials for Math Kangaroo. The Math Kangaroo website has um, a large database of free papers. You can access those free papers. The US version is, of course, you will be charged for it. But if you're on the lobby, I ha have had a workshop where I have given uh, a bunch of questions from the past papers. And I will be posting three past papers from the US that usually retail for quite a large sum. So you have those as well. If you go on the Think Academy YouTube channel, there's breakdowns of Math Kangaroo questions and what's the best way to learn them. Uh, and online, you just have a lot of resources for Math Kangaroo. 
Neha, I can try and. Yeah, hi. Oh, it says you're unmuted, Neha. You can go for it now. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Uh, I cannot hear you, Neha. Hi. Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, uh, I just had a question uh, for the math kangaroo. Is it uh, is this uh, test is from Think or uh, is it the US based? It's the US based test. So uh, Think Academy is just we're separate from Math Kangaroo. Um, our curriculum is based on competition style questions, and like I said, we try to infuse the curriculum gap in public schools and private schools in the US, and try to work towards questions that are more oriented towards logical solving, which involves a lot of competition questions. And that's why we try to use Math Kangaroo as a resource because that's where most of those lie, but we're separate from Math Kangaroo. We're not associated with them. We are a center. So kids can take the test at our center, but besides that, there is no other association. Thank you. And it's online, offline, both, right? Both, I would recommend online. Okay, and uh, it, it this like, can we know how many hours test is this? Uh, yes, I did do an MK webinar on that. If you want, I can post it again so you can get into logistics. It's based on the grade. If I recall cor correctly, it is 75 minutes uh, for the test. If my memory serves me right, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Of course. Uh, no worries. Thank you so much for attending. And uh, we, should, we shall conclude now. Thank you so much. And uh, you guys have a nice day.